And welcome to the SoFo Vegans Live podcast. Yes, we are setting up this podcast with Dr. Michael Clapper. We had him during our first season, and now we're excited to bring him back. Thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely, Sean. Thank you for the invitation. Great to be with your viewers in beautiful South Florida. Glad I live here. <laughs> And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is a lot has happened in the past year, especially because Whoa. of the, of the yeah, <laughs> that's an understatement, right? Uh, because of the pandemic. And what I haven't heard a lot about is how has the plant-based physician movement, how has the, the movement for more plant-based physicians in the hospitals, in general practice, because I've heard you talk about it a lot in different seminars, workshops, master classes, and I wanted to get your take on that. And um, also at the end of the conversation, talk about what can we do as vegans or as new vegans to have the right information when those common questions come up. So maybe go over some of those questions. And if you're in the audience right now listening, submit those questions because I'll be going through them in a little bit later. And also, if you have any comments for Dr. Uh, Dr. Clapper, you can go ahead and put them there as well. How does that sound, Dr. Clapper? Sounds like a winner. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started. I know the first time we had you on, we had you do the vegan origin story. But for this time, if you could just get anyone who's listening right now who may not be familiar with all the work that you've done, just kind of give them an idea of you know what your contribution has been to the movement. Uh, well, I'm a classically trained Western physician. I uh, graduated from the University of Illinois College of Medicine back in the early 70s. Uh, for the first 10 years of my medical career, I uh, practiced regular blood and guts medicine in emergency rooms, operating rooms, urgent care clinics. Uh, but uh, 10 years, nine years into my practice, I had my plant-based epiphany for a number of reasons. Uh, I adopted a whole food plant-based diet myself. Uh, within 12 weeks, a 20-pound spare tire fat had melted off my gut. My high blood pressure went to normal. My high cholesterol went to normal. I felt great waking up in a nice, lean body every day. Uh, and at that point, uh, I had left general practice after a few years from frustration of not being able to help my patients. Uh, at that point, I knew I wanted to go back to general practice and, uh, and help my patients undergo the same wonderful benefits I had. Uh, so I did that. I was in a residency in anesthesiology. I went back to general practice. And for the past 35 years now, I've been using plant-based nutrition, vegan nutrition, uh, as the foundation of my medical practice. And my patients who follow a whole food plant-based diet experience the same wonderful changes uh, that I've experienced. And it's really a remarkable thing to see. Within days of, uh, of someone who walks in my office uh, uh, obese and diabetic and hypertensive and clogged up and inflamed, within days of starting to run a, a food stream full of colorful salads and hearty vegetable soups and big plates of steamed green and yellow vegetables and tasty curries and uh, satisfying chilies uh, based on beans, not beef, uh, it's remarkable what happens. The transformation is just stunning. The, Within days, the obesity starts to melt away. The, the waistline starts to get smaller. Uh, the arteries relax and open up. The high blood pressures come down. The inflammation subsides. The sore joints get better. Uh, the insulin receptors clear out. Type 2 diabetes goes away. You can stop these people's insulin. Uh, and uh, so many other things. Uh, often psoriasis clears up in the skin. Acne gets better. Asthmatic lungs stop wheezing when you stop the dairy protein and migraine headaches get better. Uh, it's remarkable. They transform into these leaner, healthier people uh, that don't need a bunch of pills and potions and procedures. And uh, as a result, I'm the happiest doctor I know. My, my patients get healthy. And, and when I show pictures to the medical students of the before and after pictures of these um, ill, obese patients uh, who transform into these lean, disease-free patients, I ask the students, what more could you want from your patients? Why are you going into medicine? What greater gift could you help them achieve, help them earn, uh, than, a, than a healthy body with normal blood pressure, normal blood sugars that don't need 
uh, the services of people like me. Uh, and, and, and this has been the focus of my, uh, my medical career uh, for the past 35 years. But uh, as you're nice enough to imply, sorry, I'm rambling on here a bit, but uh, uh, we know the power of uh, plant-based nutrition, but my noble profession totally ignores it. We go through medical school and we practice medicine daily in the hospitals and clinics like what our patients are eating it has no effect on these diseases. Uh, and, uh, and we go immediately, I, and I say, you know, pharmacosclerosis is set into my colleagues' brains that drugs and surgery are the only treatment. And so immediately, you know, to the operating room, you know, get out the prescription pad. When the truth is, doctor, it's the food your patients are eating. And there's this gaping hole uh, in, uh, in medical education, where we just blow past the effects of the patient's daily diet, especially the standard American diet version of the daily diet, what it really does to the body. And uh, so I've been trying to fill that hole. I've, with your help and uh, others, I've been going around to medical schools and giving the students the, the lecture I wish someone had given me when I was a first year med student. Why didn't someone tell me the importance of food and what a whole food plant-based diet can do. So uh, through our Moving Medicine Forward uh, initiative, uh, I've been traveling around to the medical schools in North America, Australia, Europe, uh, but then along comes COVID and the air travel gets uh, uh, pretty uh, minimal. And so, um, so we switched to an electronic medium and we put this information into 12 master classes in plant-based nutrition, which you were instrumental in helping to produce. Uh, and uh, so we've been helping people who are interested in actually using plant-based nutrition to get themselves healthy, uh, to avail themselves of uh, our master class information. And this is for everyone in the health professions. Yes, doctors and medical students absolutely are the, are the key uh, demographic there. But dentists and nurses and pharmacists and podiatrists and dietitians and occupational therapists, physical therapists, everybody in the helping professions needs to know the, this wonderful information, as does the general public. So that's been keeping me off the streets. <laughs> it's not it's been my major pro project. Uh, and um, we're, uh, we're still doing, uh, once a week at least, I, I zoom in to a medical school class. I was in, um, at, uh, let's see, I was at Yale a couple of weeks ago, uh, the University of Pittsburgh, uh, University of California, San Diego, University of Texas, Houston. Uh, I've been uh, doing electronic appearances uh, for the past few months, but we're starting to talk about well, getting back uh, on the road. And, and there, there's nothing like being in a room with a couple hundred live medical students interested in the subject. So hopefully we'll be able to deliver this in person. So, um, so moving medicine forward has been my passion for the past couple of years and it remains so. So uh, uh, thank you for letting me share that information with your viewers. And, and I actually had an opportunity to sit in a few, in all of those um, conversations that you were having with the Moving Medicine Forward, the digital uh, masterclass, and just to see the amount of, of appreciation that the students and the attendees had for the information that was being shared, it's exciting to feel like there are lots of people that represent that across the country that want to get into the practice and do it. So the question I have are what other obstacles are currently present that would prevent, are, are there obstacles that may prevent someone who wants to take on that stance from actually sharing that information with their patients? Oh my, Sean, um, talk about, you know, standing at the foot of this mountain that we got to climb. There's a, a mountain, uh, mountain of inertia, not the good kind, you know, um, Newton's first law says an object at rest tends to stay at rest. And, uh, and so it is with medical education and that, uh, uh, doctors continue to do what they've been trained to do. You know, they say when the only tool you know how to use is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And if the only way you know how to deal with diabetes is to get that prescription pad out and write a script for metformin and insulin uh, and glipizide, then that's what you're going to do. That's what you see. Uh, but so we, we've got to 
uh, again, reach the, the young medical students, the, the old professors who stand in the back of the room during my lectures with their arms folded and doing a tut tut uh, nonsense. Uh, the, there, some, some, you can't count anybody out. Some actually open to the message and change, but many of them, you know, they're going to do what they do till they're retired. And these young, the med students become young attending physicians pretty quick. They become the young professors quick. And those are the ones uh, I want to reach, like Johnny Appleseed. I'm planting seeds in their heads that hopefully will, um, will sprout. So a lot of it is just due to the sclerotic edifice of medical education. But, there are some real specific issues. Uh, the, the docs who are resistant say, listen, well, I don't know anything about nutrition. I never learned about this stuff. Second, I don't have time to do this. I got a, I got a waiting room full of patients. I got seven minutes with each patient. I don't have time uh, to do this kind of counseling. And third, I don't get paid for it. Uh, and uh, why should I put any time and effort into doing this? And these are huge obstacles. And so we, one at a time have to deal with all three of those uh, issues. Uh, yes, um, we weren't taught anything about it. That's true, doctor. But uh, in my slide presentations and online, if you, uh, there's plenty of, of, of CME grant or, or uh, endowed uh, medical education on plant-based nutrition. Go to the University of Winchester um, uh, website that's in the UK, but they got this wonderful six-week course in the fundamentals of, of plant-based nutrition. Take that course. Go to Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, PCRM.org, and click on Physicians, and you'll you'll get these free courses in, in evidence-based heart disease treatment, diabetes, etc. Uh, join the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. They've got the courses. You can educate yourself. It's not that hard. To, we're going to choose the, the bean chili instead of the beef chili, you know, that, where, you know, that steady stream of soups and salads and greens and veggies is what does the magic. It's not that hard, doctor. You, you can learn this stuff. And uh, so, you know, we're trying to get that message across. Second, I don't have time to do this. That's right. You don't, doctor, and you don't have to. There are now plant-based dietitians. In every community, if you just Google it, you'll see that all these lovely people um, who are skilled in counseling about plant-based nutrition. Let her do the counseling. Let him do the shopping or take from shopping. Uh, so you just, doctor, need to know you're looking at a patient, that overweight, diabetic, hypertensive, clogged up and inflamed patient is there from what they're eating, doctor. You just need to recognize that one fact and you refer to the plant-based dietitian let her do the counseling, let her show them the videos, let her read the articles with them, let her take them shopping or him. Uh, and, uh, and you just see them back in a month and see if they're not leaner with better blood pressure, et cetera. They will be if they're not, you know, talk to the dietitian. But, uh, but there's, uh, the dietitians will do this counseling. There's uh, nurses leaving hospital medicine. They make great health coaches. Uh, there's health coaches and, and dietitians to do the counseling for you, doctor. Uh, and third, I don't get paid for it. That's starting to change. Even uh, Kaiser and other uh, insurance companies are understanding that if they keep their patients healthier, they, they keep more money. Uh, and so there's a, now a type of value-based actuarial compensation uh, for keeping people healthy. There's value to the community. For every CEO that doesn't go down with a heart attack, you don't have to train a new one. Uh, he keeps running the country, the company that keeps paying taxes to the community, keeps doing good work. There's value there. And, the, and for the insurance company to not have to put out a quarter million dollars for a coronary bypass, uh, they'll, they'll pay the doctor 10000 they'll pay the patient 10000 You know, there are such, I'm not saying that Blue Cross is going to do that to, to your, for your viewers tomorrow. But, but these kind of new concepts are starting to infiltrate uh, into, into the medical structure. So we start, and we'll save so much money from all these procedures not done. So, um, so it's, a, it's an early time. It's, uh, you know, I've delivered hundreds of babies, you know, we're, we're trying to birth this thing and, uh, uh, and, and broadcast such as yours. And because uh, and, it's a matter of education to put the, the uh, concepts in the public's head. So, oh, really? Wow, the, the food can reverse these diseases. Wow, we can actually save money. There's ways to do this. 
it, it's so important. Uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, you know, talking about an idea whose time has come, uh, this certainly has, it certainly is of that class. So, um, so we're trying to get those ideas out. I could spend all day talking about the nuances of it, but, uh, but to, uh, to the spirit of your question, it's a huge obstacle to overcome, but we can't not do it. There's no failing with, with this. We must transform us. The, the, the Western medical model is from the 1950s and, and 60s. You know, you wait till the patient shows some, some symptom of some bad disease, of uh, clogged arteries or a stroke or a heart attack or a cancer, and then you pull out the machinery to try to undo the damage. How wonderful if you could avoid that. People should go through their whole lives lean and healthy with normal blood pressures and not being professional medical patients. And that needs to uh, be transmitted to the doctors. So it's an exciting time, frustrating time, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a worthy cause for us all to contribute. And you, sir, are, are helping with this, uh, with this podcast. And, and just in terms of the, the year and the times that we're in right now, um, I, I would, do want to get a little bit more into just the health implications of not, you know, looking at your diet, looking at what you're putting in your body. But I want to take a moment to look at what are some of the positive things that have happened in the last couple of months in terms of plant-based um, medicine, plant-based um, eating, whole food, plant-based eating that you might want to spotlight? Well, it's, it's exciting. If you've got, you know, they say once you, what you know about, you see. Once you know about something, you start seeing it you know, everywhere. And it's certainly true when you're looking through suddenly that plant-based uh, vision that you get from, from doing it yourself and, and, and watching it in medical practice. Once, you, once you've got that kind of nutrition vision, the plant-based nutrition vision, but it's hard to it's hard to open up a medical journal. You're jamming here. It's hard to open one without seeing some article about about plant based nutrition. Uh, and, you know, pick a disease: blood pressure, diabetes, autoimmune disease, uh, uh, inflammatory diseases, skin disease. You know, it's percolating up through the medical journals. It, it's hard to think of a disease that doesn't get better with a whole food plant based diet. It's, so many of the diseases are from from the wrong fuel going through our tissues. Uh, so so that's exciting. Every time I see one of those articles, I go, yes, so, yep, that's right. And so you know th th that general trend is really exciting. Um, but the you know in the background of your question, I think um, you know as far as practical things in the last few months. Uh, if, you, if you don't mind me opening up this very important issue, um, has to do with your, the one state of health and resistance uh, to getting laid low by the COVID virus. And, and in watching this whole tragedy unfold over this past year and a half, there's been so many missed opportunities. We won't go into all, all, all the politics and all that stuff. But one of the biggest missed opportunities is a year ago, March, when we were first going into that initial lockdown, how fine it would have been, what great good could have been done if one of the doctors or a whole bunch of the doctors got together and looked right in the camera and said, look, people, you're going to be home for the next couple of months, it looks like. Use this time to get yourself healthier. Uh, learn about what what healthy nutrition really is. Learn how to whip up some really hearty vegetable soups and stews and chilies, and or learn where where you can order them in, and and eat lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, lots of salads. Get yourself trim. Uh, drop that extra weight. Uh, get rid of that diabetes. Uh, so if you do encounter the virus, it's going to be much much less severe, and and so we can emerge from that first tunnel leaner, healthier, uh, more resistant, uh, more resilient. Uh, and, you know, that's been a real tragedy that, and because, because plant, whole food plant-based nutrition is, is at the apex of that process. Eat a whole food plant-based diet, just do that. And, uh, and everything gets better from there. Well, we seem to have gone the opposite direction. We've used it as an excuse uh, to sit on the couch and shovel in uh, the Cheetos and the, and the, and the Ding Dongs there. 
and uh, and now we're, we're more obese, more diabetic, and oh, it's such an tr unnecessary tragedy. So, uh, but it's not too late. You, you know, that six month period went by, and then another one, and now we're in the third six months of this thing. You know, it's never too late to start eating healthy and 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 let the the magic of this wonderful healing diet flush through your tissues. Uh, yeah, with every meal, every salad, every soup brings this flood of, of, of water, first of all, but all these phytonutrients that are antioxidants, they quench free radicals, they promote tissue repair, they're stabilizing molecules. Um, use this time to, to biochemically restore yourself uh, with healthy whole plant foods that we were meant to run on. Um, uh, every gorilla knows what to eat. Every bonobo knows what to eat. They're, we are plant-eating hominids. Uh, we are not carnivorous apes. We're not sugar-eating apes. Uh, we are, we've got fingers on our hands, not claws. we got flat grinding molar teeth and rotary jaws for grinding up plant material. We've got big, long intestines for digesting fiber. We, the enzymes in our saliva are starch digesting enzymes. And so clearly, we're plant-eating hominids. If we, if we honor our anatomy and our natures, nobody likes eating raw meat, but raw apple, raw carrot, pretty good. Uh, if we honor our nature and our anatomy and eat, eat, eat plants, um, wonderful things happen and we'll be far healthier and then be able to emerge out of this uh, dreadful uh, trial that we're all in. And, and I'm going to close out on this particular portion of our conversation with this last question, um, only because I really want us to get into how we can support vegans and pre-vegans on communication, because that's my huge thing. How do we communicate yes. those answers? And they can refer to this. I'll cut it up into little pieces and put it out in articles um, on these different topics that at some point, if you are living this lifestyle, a family member or friend, they're going to ask you the question. And you know, if you get to have a great answer. Um, so I want to get into that. That's really what I want to spend the rest of the time. But I'm going to leave this last part of, is there, are there any tips, anything that's maybe be, that might be circulating from a physician's point of view that you would love to address in terms of, um, you know, COVID or any of that situation? I'll give you this opportunity to address that without kind of prompting anything specifically. You got it. Thank you. Um, again, keep yourself as healthy and resilient as you can. Uh, we'll get to the food in a minute. Get enough sleep. Uh, that's a great way to open the door to infections. I know when I cheat on my sleep and I'm three, four hours up too late, my throat gets scratchy, I get sick. Get enough sleep. Uh, we repair ourselves when we sleep. Drink enough water. If you, uh, if you don't drink enough water, the secretions in the lungs get thicker. Um, the lungs don't work as well. It's easier for them to get infected. Now, I have a couple of good you know, tall glasses of water every day, but uh, eat lots of soups and salads and greens, which have lots of water in it, but, but drink plenty of water. Uh, get outside every day. We need the sun on our faces. Uh, we need physical activity. I mean, at least go around the block a few times. If not, uh, um, uh, you know, actually go to the park and, uh, and get out in nature. It's, uh, we, we're suffering from nature deficit disorder. Uh, get out in nature and, uh, and, and combine it with a good, good brisk walk. That's basically all you need to do. But it's also um, important to do a little physical exertion. I've got a, uh, a, a recumbent exercise bike in my living room, the one that you sit up on, I don't hunch over on it, I sit up on it. And every other morning I get up and pedal. Uh, and as I'm, as I'm pedaling, I turn up the resistance and then grab, um, and then grab two 10 pound hand weights. And while I'm pedaling for my cardio, I'm doing an upper body workout uh, to keep my muscles toned. And 40 minutes of that, boy, you work up a good sweat. So it uh, doesn't matter what the weather is. Uh, you, can, you can do something like that, uh, a treadmill, but just get, get active. Um, stay connected. It's so easy to, to cubicle yourself off, even mentally. Um, we are tribal creatures. We need each other. We need that connection. Uh, a, a look, uh, a, a word, a connection, even if it's uh, electronic. Um, uh, and 
keep, you know, it's just trite already to say it, but we need to do nice things for each other. The very act of giving, of, of helping each other is nourishing. It makes us uh, feel worthwhile, less alone. Yeah, absolutely. And then finally, yes, eat a healthy plant-based diet. Have something fresh every day. Don't eat everything out of cans and boxes. You need a, at least a salad or a, you know a couple of apples and bananas uh, every day. Mangoes, papayas. We're in South Florida. There's such great fruit here. So, but have something fresh every day. Like Dr. Furman says, the salad is the main dish. So, uh, uh, so eat a big salad every day. Uh, but get into those lovely. Uh, non-gluten grains, millet and quinoa and buckwheat. Uh, uh, those are wonderful. Eat a lot of legumes. Anything in a pod is legume. Beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils. They're loaded with protein. Where am I going to get my protein? To get it out of lentils and grains and, and uh, all, food, all greens, all, all plant foods have protein, but emphasize those legumes. Uh, and um, uh, you, that's all you and, and enjoy fruit for uh, for dinner for uh, for dessert. Don't eat sugar as a food. Don't like uh, a vegan donut or a vegan cupcake a chunk of sugar. It 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 it's damages your proteins. It oxidizes and stiffens them. Uh, eat fruits. Uh, uh, we, uh, we, I made oatmeal this morning. Threw in some raisins and some date pieces. It came out nice and sweet. Uh, and uh, uh, mango chunks in the evening are lovely desserts. Uh, last night we had raspberries with some oat milk on it. Uh, you get into the fruits for desserts and sweets. If you do that, uh, all those things, uh, you'll be a healthy person and you will get through this. Uh, and we're seem to it seems to be, at least in this country, um, the, the, my, oh, our brothers and sisters in India are just undergoing it. This, this is see what happened. This is no laughing matter, this virus. And it can break your medical system. And the Canadians are running into it too. This is serious business. So, uh, so, so far we're doing good. Keep doing what we are doing to uh, emerge from this, uh, from this uh, epidemic. And thank you for sharing that. And I'm definitely going to get that out there, you know, as its own standalone, as well as what we're going to be talking about, because this is something that I even, there's so much information going on and, you know, it's, and you probably hear if you, watch a lot of these podcasts and you go to a lot of these festivals, you probably heard the same thing over and over again. But I think going in with the intention of this is a guide for you to be able to reference these answers and not just from Dr. Cla Michael Clapper, but from a lot of different people who have different takes, but essentially saying the same thing. So that way, you know, people aren't trying to get you, they're like getting it, which I feel like is the good distinction. So with that being said, kind of tying into the last thing you just said, one thing I always get is I don't know, like if I go to vegan, what, what am I going to snack on? I like, I don't, you know, what are some things I can snack on? And assuming that this person isn't already eating fruits and vegetables, which is the boat I was in when I first became vegan. So what are some of those transitional foods that they can snack on? Um, yeah, I'll leave that open. Sure, absolutely. And uh, when I'm working at the computer here, uh, let's see, what do I got? Uh, I have pistachio nuts here um, uh, that uh, I'll crack a couple, uh, a couple an hour. I use with my usual rate. Uh, so you know, assuming you don't have problems, you're not. Uh, you know, terribly overweight and trying to lose weight, uh, uh, and or you don't have artery problems. Uh, you know, moderate amounts of nuts are fine. So, you know, a small handful. Uh, walnuts have become my favorite because of the omega threes. I've reluctantly left the cashews behind, but uh, but occasionally I'll have a few raw cashews. But I've really started to like walnuts, and combine that with raisins. You know, the old classic nut and raisins mixture, but use walnuts and organic raisins. Man, that's a nice snack. Uh, and uh, and I've learned how to snack. Um, it's not good to sit in front of the TV with a five pound bag on cashews or nuts or whatever and shovel them in. You know, that's, that's unconscious shoveling. Uh, turn the TV off. Ah, walnut. Mm. And uh, put it in your mouth and mm, chew it up and feel that subtle sweetness in there and taste it and inhale it and uh, put a little behind your ear. And, you know, just be with the experience of walnut eating and uh, finally chew it up and swallow. 
hmm, nice, I think I'll have another, ooh, I'll, here, I'll take a walnut and a couple of raisins and put that in your mouth. And cause that's what, you know, when you eat a candy bar, what is it? It's, it's a mixture of, of sugar and crunchy and salty, and you put it in your mouth, and then you get that pleasant sensation why you, why, you, why you bought the kind bar. Well, you can do that with real nuts and real, real fruit. Uh, create a candy bar in your mouth there. So, and, but, but be fully present with it. Not, don't be unconscious while you're uh, watching uh, uh, TikTok videos. Uh, so, uh, so the nuts and raisins work. Um, any, as you mentioned, uh, any fruit. Um, if you don't know how to cut the, uh, mango into cubes, uh, learn that little skill. It's really lovely. You slice it, the, the two halves of it you know, on that big flat uh, seed on the inside. Uh, and then uh, score the uh, score each half in, in squares, and then invert it, uh, turn it inside out, uh, and the cubes just appear. You can either eat it directly off there, or take a sharp knife and and uh, cut them off, and they fall into a bowl. And those are just so intense; they're really wonderful. You one at a time, um, so that's a good thing. Um, the um, um, the, the vegan treats are seductive, and you know, once a week uh, to have a you know a, a, a half of a vegan chocolate chip cookie or whatever, I suppose. But they're all just sugar. None of them are really healthy. Uh, and I, uh, that comment was just to keep things in perspective. Uh, uh, they're, they're, they don't do good things for you when you eat sugar as a food. Um, and if you're going to be eating that. Whole, uh, half a cookie once a week is what I'm saying. That you know that the, they can really hurt you if you really eat them in quantity. So uh, it's a it's a taste experience and an, ex, an expensive one. Don't don't go overboard on that. Um, now last night my wife uh, Elise uh, we had uh, curried chickpeas over um, over saffron rice uh, with some steamed kale. Uh, and then and there's leftovers, and I'm gonna, I have that for uh, for lunch, uh, and I'm going to stretch it out all afternoon, and, and just one good mouthful of the, of the curry, uh, chickpeas and, and rice, and a little bit of kale, and and again I uh, you know I step push away from the computer, uh, you know, and I and I have a little bit, and I'm just it's a great break uh, from from the intensity here. And it's a healthy snack, you know. You know, last night's leftovers eaten, you know, stretched out. Um, salty, uh, savory things. There's, um, you know, you can. There's all sorts of tricks you can do with uh, dried mushrooms, a little tamari sauce, and this and that. But again, they're all just treats. Uh, each, you know, three solid whole plant meals a day, and uh, and the occasional nuts and raisins and cut up fruits will, will get you through in between. All right. And that, that's a lot to go off of. And thank you for sharing all of those different tips because it shows you that how, you know, not only that, but I think I like the idea of savoring your food and because that slows down the eating and I, I would assume fills you up a lot faster than if you were just to shovel it all in your mouth and then, you know, have indigestion and hiccups or whatever. <laughs> um, yes. And then Marco, one of our, one of our viewers, Marco Caraki Suarez, Suarez, add walnuts to oatmeal, my favorite. You bet. Uh, just had it this morning, and uh, I've been doing my own uh, DHA experiment here. The question is whether uh, whether we need whether all vegans need to be consuming algae derived DHA supplements. And there's an argument that uh, some uh, vegan doctors, with all sincerity, say yes, all vegans should be taking DHA. We don't uh, convert the linolenic acid in flax seeds and walnuts into DHA, there's longer chain fatty acids, so everybody should be taking um, algae-derived DHA capsules. Really? Um, uh, one, I can think of a couple of possible, possible uh, negative things about those uh, supplements, but, what, but our body makes everything else from what we eat. We make all the proteins from the amino acids in the beans and, and the rice. Do we really need to be doing this? Uh, what happens in your tissues? So, um, so I said, well, let me find out. Uh, so what I've done, I'm doing six weeks. Uh, every morning, um, I, uh, 
I take three tablespoons of, uh, we, we grind up flax, chia, and hemp seeds. We got a big jar of it. And so I put three tablespoons of that on my oatmeal, and, and I crush up a handful of walnuts, put that on there. So I've been doing uh, three tablespoons of flax and hemp seeds and walnuts daily for six weeks. Then on the same day, same day, uh, in the uh, middle of May, uh, I'm, I started this April 1st. I'm going to Quest Lab, stick out an arm, and get their omega check done. But on that same day, I'm sending a blood tube off to Genova Laboratories, sending the, the blood spot off to Great Plains uh, Laboratories, uh, and I'm sending uh, another blood spot off to Omega Quant. I'm sending to four different laboratories, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to get the results back. And if they all come back high, then that convinced me I don't need to be taking omega, uh, uh, LG drive omega-3 tails because my 74-year-old body seems to be able to convert the linolenic acid into the uh, uh, into DHA. If they all come back low, then okay, I'm convinced. I, I will start taking the DHA. I don't know who else needs to, how, at what age, but fair enough, uh, I'll be convinced. If they come back all over this, the place, uh, you know, one's high, one's low, you know, two, you know, two's high, one's low, one in the middle, um, then it makes me question the whole testing issue here. That, that's another issue here. But uh, so stay tuned, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm doing this little self-experiment here. I'll let everybody know uh, towards the end of May uh, how, it, how it all came out when I get the results back. So... Um, I'm not sure why I went off on that tangent, but I just wanted to, to share that with everyone as far as, oh, uh, because uh, your re reader uh, sent in about walnuts and oatmeal. Yes, I've been doing that too, and uh, connected with my uh, with my great DHA experiment here. And, and I want to encourage everyone that's watching this live right now, if you have any questions, anything that you would want to be able to find an answer to, um, put it in the comments. We'll be pulling them up. Um, periodically and definitely trying to get to as many before we close out in a little bit. Um, the next question I do, because there's some big ones, I'm going to save the biggest one for the end, the one that we all hear all the time. And I think you know which one I'm talking about. So the next one I want to talk about is B12, because one of the things that I experience and a lot of people may you know concur is that when you go vegan, all of a sudden everybody in your family is a medical expert and they want to talk to you about B12. Even you know, so um, that's that's like clear the air. What is B12? Is it something that we all should be taking and how should we be taking it? Thank you. Uh, such an important topic and really needs to be dealt with clearly. Vitamin B12, cobalamin, is absolutely essential to keep your brain healthy, to keep your blood healthy, keep your spinal cord healthy. We need some. A couple times a week, you need some vitamin B12. Uh, where does it come from? Uh, animals don't make it. Cows don't make it. Chick don't, chickens don't make it. Pigs don't make it. No animal makes it. Humans don't make it either. It's made by microbes that live in the soil and in the natural world, in the streams and the rivers. Uh, that's where vitamin B12 comes from. Uh, the deer and the antelope have B12 in their muscles because they're eating grass all day and they're pulling up clumps of grass that have um, uh, pieces, uh, particles of dirt clinging to the roots. And in that soil uh, are the B12 producing microbes. The deer and the antelope and the buffalo uh, eat, eat those microbes, swallow it down. The, the, in their gut, the microbes produces B, B12 uh, that's brought out to the muscles. So when people eat beef, uh, you know, red meat to get B12, yeah, but it, it's the cow didn't make it. It's, it was bacterial B12 all along, and you know that's important to to remember. Now, why do we why do we go down that road? Because a thousand years ago, ten thousand million years ago, when we were living Earth connected lives, we humans we were got our B12 same place the deer and the antelope. There, we spent all day foraging and digging up roots and tubers. Uh, and um, and we didn't wash them off under chlorinated drinking water. We probably knocked it on our leg and, and we ate it. But most of the calories uh, that our, our Paleolithic ancestors ate did not come from mammoth meat, came from roots and tubers and starchy vegetables that the, most of the women gathered all day. Uh, and and we would inevitably get the vitamin B12 microbes on the surface of those vegetables. When we were thirsty, we'd go to the nearest stream and plop down and drink uh, stream water, and we would get B12 through the stream water. We used to be getting 
on the B12 in the same place the other natural creatures do. But welcome to the 21st century and modern sanitation. Nobody's drinking out of streams. Nobody's eating unwashed vegetables. Uh, we, we wash everything in chlorinated water. And as a result, the natural B12 sources have been taken from us as part of this exchange, this bargain that we make in exchange for drinking water that won't give us cholera and typhoid fever. Uh, and we're willing to make that, that trade-off, uh, but it also costs us the natural sources of B12. And so not because a, whole, a natural whole food plant-based diet is deficient in some way, but due to modern sanitation and this bargain that we've made. Now, the one thing we have to do, uh, if you are completely plant-based, is you got to find uh, a source of vitamin B12. Um, well, guess what? They Nowadays, they're taking those same B12-producing microbes, they culture it from in big vats, and they they isolate the B12 and put it into these old liquids and sprays and tablets, and, and that's where you get it. No animal has to die. And you don't need it every day if you're otherwise healthy. You know, three times a week, put a 1,000 micrograms of, of vitamin B12 under your tongue if it's a drop or one of those little sublingual micro dots. Um, and uh, these, these sprays work well as well. I like the kind that absorb in the mouth rather than swallowed as part of a multivitamin. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, don't make a big stance, but don't neglect it because uh, uh, you can really damage your spinal cord and your, your peripheral nerves. Uh, don't, don't neglect it. But don't let it be an obstacle. Oh, it's not a natural diet. I have to take this off. We're not living a natural life. Nothing in this world is, is natural anymore. Our food is not what our ancestors ate. Uh, and the uh, and nothing in this world is natural. We've so sterilized it and sanitized it. It's the concession we make for modern life. Uh, take your B12 supplement a couple times a week and get on with it. But don't, don't let it be an obstacle. Uh, but let it be a uh, guideline to keep yourself healthy. And in, in terms of the B12, um, I know when I first did my initial research, I found that there's a lot of different types. The one that I actually use, I'm not affiliated with them. Um, I got them because it said vegan on it, but I think there was another element into it. It's like 80%. Oh yeah, that's the other thing. Not all of them. Um, some of them I feel, I believe have products that aren't vegan in it as well. I, Yes, it should be vegan, uh, but uh, but uh, manufacturers do all sorts of things, and they'll put in flavorings and say a lot that might not be. Yes, you should check the label, but it should just be, you should see either cyanocobalamin or methylcobalamin on the label, but basically nothing much else in there, uh, and, and that's those are the two forms. Um, the cyanocobalamin will work uh, just fine for everybody's cheaper, uh, and uh, the, the, you know, that's what I would recommend for everybody. Um, if, um, if you get your blood tests and then a certain substance called homocysteine is going up in your bloodstream, um, that's, uh, that can hurt your arteries. Uh, that says you're someone who might benefit from the methylcobalamin form. But that's a very rare condition. Most everybody does fine with the cyanocobalamin and it's cheaper. So, uh, so we have some cyanocobalamin in some form uh, a couple times a week. And you'll be fine. So I, I the one I actually have is the the other one, the methyl the methyl methyl cobalamin. Uh -huh. Great, so, works fine. Works okay. good. Cool, yep. cool. Nothing to worry about. So, so uh, along those lines, I also got a few of the other um, nutrients and nutrients and supplements that I use in the in an in an effort to see like what should we be supplementing outside of the food, the whole food, plant-based foods that we're eating. Cause I know there are certain things that we, um, that may be a little harder to get from the plants. If you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And again, we're living these lives. We eat in restaurants, we eat processed foods, uh, we eat at irregular hours. Um, it's not hard to think that we might uh, over time, shortchange ourselves in some uh, essential nutrients. Uh, one of the most uh, classic of those is the element iodine. Uh, we need it uh, for our thyroid gland to make thyroid hormone. It's absolutely essential. Uh, and if, since vegans, we don't eat fish, um, where do we get our iodine? Used to be in the soils, 
and it, and it still is, and that's another reason to, uh, uh, to buy organic produce, preferably veganic, that's been produced uh, you know, with plant materials only. Uh, and hopefully that uh, veganic farmer uh, has been nourishing their soils and they know to plow some seed weeds, some seed vegetables into their soil, and that replenishes the iodine. So, um, so be aware that the iodine can be an issue. If there's any question at all, uh, if you are going to be taking a vegan multivitamin, make sure it's got 150 micrograms of iodine. But if you want to be natural, you don't want to get into the supplement game at all, uh, then uh, you should give, find a way to get these sea vegetables into your diet. Now, there's the three that are, are the safest and the most, uh, uh, the most delicious are wakame, arame, and dulse. Wakame, W-A-K-A-M-E, uh, is the green uh, uh, seaweed in the Japanese restaurant salads. Uh, it's really tasty. Throw a gobbler of it into your soup or into your salad a few times a week. You'll get your iodine needs met. Uh, Arame is the dark, wormy kind of sea vegetables. Again, throw it into a salad or a soup a few times a week. And dulse is, it tastes a little salty, uh, but I find it very pleasant. Just chewing up some, some dulse leaves or breaking it up, put it onto a salad three times a week. That's really the best, most natural place to get your iodine. It should work just fine. Uh, but again, if you are taking a supplement, uh, 150 to 200 micrograms of iodine uh, is a good thing to do. The other one to consider is vitamin D. Uh, it's controversial. Some people say we don't need it, uh, evil. But, uh, you know, vitamin D is produced by our own bodies. It's not really a vitamin. It's a hormone uh, that our skin produces when sunlight falls on our skin. Uh, and when a thousand years ago, 10,000 million years ago, we spent all day naked in the sun running away from leopards and climbing trees and foraging for food. And vitamin D was not an issue. Uh, we made plenty of it. Uh, our skins look like old suitcases by age 40. Uh, but you got eaten by a leopard at age 41. Nobody cared. Uh, but, uh, but nowadays, we do care. We're afraid of skin cancer and photo aging. And so we hide from the sun. We spend all day inside. And when we do go outside, we've got a hat on, we've got sleeves on, we've got sunscreen on. And as a result, very little ultraviolet light from the sun is falling on our skin. And a lot of people have really low vitamin D levels. And we find that it's essential uh, not only for bone health and calcium absorption, uh, but also our immune cells depend on it. Uh, um, tissue repair uh, depends on it. Fighting infections depends on sufficient vitamin D. Uh, and so uh, if you are going to have any blood tests done, get your vitamin D level checked. And you want your D level, I like it between 40 and 70 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, and if it's down in your boots, if it's five or eight or whatever, uh, you, you'd be wise to uh, take 2,000 international units of vitamin D daily. And that's a safe dose really for everybody. Uh, if there's any question, uh, take a couple of uh, uh, a couple thousand international units. Uh, there's liquids that uh, it's a thousand units per drop to two drops on your tongue would do it. But again, it's in it's in these various vegan multivitamins. Uh, so those are the most important: B12, iodine, and uh, and vitamin D. And if you if you make sure you're topped up there, um, the other ones are zinc, but that's in root vegetables and beans and legumes and grains. You should eat plenty of those so you meet your zinc needs. Uh, and that's all you need. Either eat plenty of green vegetables so your gut microbes can make vitamin K2. Uh, so those, that's all food, food stuff, the, the zinc and the, and the vitamin K2. The only three that you need to consider something, definitely B12 and probably D. And that's, that's all. And again, use those sea vegetables for the iodine. Like, uh... That's awesome. So pretty much... Uh, you those two are the main ones and the rest you can find just by diversifying the foods, the whole food, plant-based foods that you're eating. Yeah. That's awesome. So we have some comments and questions from the chat. So we're going to jump into a few of those and then go back into some of the questions and actually start to wrap up because we have a um, little less than 10 minutes. Um, so first I want to Bob Newman. Hi, Doc. We met at True North when you were doing your first water fast. I enjoyed your, la your, enjoyed your talk last week, John Robbins. You rock. 
<laughs> thank you. <laughs> so that was, um, thank you so much, Bob, for tuning in. Um, this was a comment from Chuck from earlier. I find that it's easier for me to stick to healthy eating by making one dish that's enough food for a few meals. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, Abs, there's so much in his question slash answer. Um, and absolutely big batch cooking is the key to not driving yourself nuts with the vegan food thing. I don't want to spend all day chopping and cooking. You don't have to. Maybe you get a crock pot, make up a big honker pot of hearty vegetable, bean, lentil, quinoa soup, uh, and, um, uh, and take, a, um, take a, some Tupperware freezer containers, ladle the soup into it, let it cool, Put the lids on, put them in your freezer. So you got a bunch of frozen soup portions, those times you don't feel like cooking. Bring them out, heat them, and eat them. So absolutely use your freezer. But absolutely, um, uh, ladle out um, into a pot the soup that you want to keep warm during that day and let the rest of that pot cool down. Put it in the fridge and work on it tomorrow and the next day. So if you make up a big pot of soup on Sunday night, eat it Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And Thursday, make up another big pot of soup and eat that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So you only have to cook like twice a week. And you and these stews and chilies and soups, uh, uh, casseroles, they absolutely lend themselves to batch cooking. And it's the key to, to not having to cook and chop. Though these days, by the way, uh, you can go to the freezer case at, uh, at your favorite supermarket and you'll find or bags of, of organic vegetables already cut up. So, so if you're making that soup, just open a bag of frozen, cut up organic veggies, throw it in the pot, and you don't even have to spend time, you know, doing all that shopping and prep. But the more you should, get, you know, have some personal input into the food you're making. It's a sacred act, and it nourishes you to do it as well as eat it. But uh, absolutely, he's absolutely right. Uh, make those batch cooking uh, uh, entrees, and you'll save yourself a lot of time. And then this next question actually comes from someone from our meetup community. A lot of people are watching it from over there as well. So this is, comes from Stephen. He goes by Stephen Vegan. Hi, Dr. Clapper. It's always an honor to hear you speak. Have you heard any success in treating patients with primary immune deficiencies like CVID, common variable immune deficiency? Do you have any specific dietary or other suggestions? Thank you. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm missing the first word. What kind of deficiency? Um, common variable, CVID. Common variable. Wow, I've not heard that particular term before. But it, it's, you know, we, we pigeonhole these things into these various diseases. The truth is we've got this miracle of the universe called in our immune system. And when you think about what it does, it's, it makes you want to get down on your knees and say thank you. I mean, our insides, our guts are teeming with microbes that would kill us. Um, the the uh, Pseudomonas and Entercoccus and Streptococcus, they get out in our bloodstream, but they don't because our healthy immune system keeps them, uh, keeps them behaving where they should. The food that we're eating has, has microbes and toxins and, our, and we all should be poisoning ourselves with our immune system, keeps that from happening. We cut ourselves and, and our staphylococcus and streptococcus bacteria and our skin that should leap into that wound and spread through our tissues and kill us with a cellulitis or septicemia and it doesn't happen because our immune system constantly 24-7 on sentinel duty to, to keep us healthy. So these various immune deficiencies are often because we've interfered with this amazingly complex uh, system that, that safeguards us. So first of all, stop doing anything that suppresses your immune system. Uh, what is that? Well, I already mentioned, but you want to suppress your immune system? Deprive yourself of enough sleep and eat a bunch of sugar. Uh, and, uh, and, and some alcohol uh, as well, and, uh, and processed foods of all time, even the vegan ones, but if they're, if they're sugars and ice creams, uh, but certainly uh, meat and dairy don't, you know, don't do great things for your system. It, it's looking, you know, ask any gorilla the, with a healthy skin, um, the, your immune system is looking for the fresh fruits and vegetables, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, so a healthy food stream, 
free of, the, of these toxins and is absolutely essential. This is there anything else can do? Yes. Uh, it turns out that when we do a brief water only fast, two days, three, four days uh, on water only, um, our, our immune cells kind of hunker down and, and they let the ketones in our blood from the fasting sweep on by, kill bacteria, etc. And then when we start eating again, our stem cells reactivate, if you will, uh, and it seems to spruce up the immune system. I think, uh, uh, and and uh, our my cynical uh, doctor critics will say there is, you know, what are you, what's, what is he talking about here? Um, but uh, we had a um, we had a patient at True North uh, came in with a, a grade three lymphoma. She had lymph nodes the size of hen's eggs. Uh, we, uh, she went on a 28 day fast. We watched that lymphoma, uh, uh, fade away. Um, the, the lymph nodes just absolutely went back to normal and, um, they, they, her oncologist couldn't find any evidence of lymphoma. I've seen patients with angry, rip roaring psoriasis on a water fast. It just settles right down, uh, and did not come back nearly as severe. Clearly the immune system got reset a bit. Uh, with these two conditions. So uh, clearly the immune system benefits as many of the other systems do. So um, so intermittent water fasting, you know, three days on, on vegetable broth or water at home, uh, you know, once or twice a month, uh, that would be a good adjunct along with all the fresh fruits and veggies and freedom from the sugars and contaminants. And thank you for that answer. And I do have another question, but I'm going to um, hold off on it because I do want to get to our last um, you know, tidbit. So Marco, thank you so much for submitting your question. And um, so the question that I, the final one that I want to focus on is one that I've heard probably the most is protein. <laughs> Where do you get your protein as a vegan and how are we going to get enough protein to survive on a vegan diet. So I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you go on that one. <laughs> well, thank you for that question. You know, that's the archetypal question. If you're not eating meat, where are you getting your protein? But again, ask any buffalo, ask any giraffe, ask any muskox. Uh, the, uh, these animals grow to thousands of pounds of mammalian muscle without ever eating cheeseburger or pepperoni pizza. The amino acids to make protein, which is what it's composed of, those amino acids are in the plant foods. Uh, they all, all animal muscle really is from the plants the animals eating. Uh, and so, so all plant foods, even fruits, have, have amino acids in them, but certainly green vegetables, yellow vegetables have it, but as I implied, the real protein powerhouses are the whole grains and the legumes, beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils, as long as you're eating a diet with whole grains and, and a helping of, of uh, lentils or beans uh, in it uh, uh, on a pretty regular basis, uh, hopefully on a daily basis, you're easily, you can't help but getting uh, 50, 60 grams of high grade protein. Uh, it's when you eat all just the junk foods and the liquids and, the, and the, if you're living on smoothies, uh, you're, you're probably not going to get the protein you need. But you eat whole plant foods, three solid meals, you eat 1,800, 2,000 calories of whole plant foods, you are guaranteed of getting more than enough protein. Uh, and so relax. The issue is we're going to your fiber. Is more, far more important, right? A healthy gut, healthy microbiome. Eat those whole plant foods, get enough fiber, the protein will take care of itself. Never seen a, a vegan protein deficient. And, and there you go. That Those are your answers for questions. And there's so many more questions. So I'm going to leave the rest of the floor up to you. Let us know um, where can we have more information, get some, maybe take some of your courses, see you, see you speak, and anything else that we didn't touch on. Thank you. Okay, I'll invite everybody to visit my website, drclapper.com. It's all spelled out, D-O-C-T-O-R-K-L-A-P-E-R.com. If you want to see what we're doing to educate the medical students, if you want to see the lecture I give them, uh, click on Moving Medicine Forward. Uh, check out the videos, and it's called What I Wish I Learned in Medical School About Nutrition. You're welcome to see that. Sure. Send it to your doctor. Um, go to my YouTube channel. Uh, go to uh, search for Dr. Clapper on YouTube. 
uh, youtube.com slash uh, Dr. Clapper, all spelled out. I've got over 120 videos there. I do I post three videos a week. You can send me questions, and I'll be glad to answer them online as well. So, uh, so go to the YouTube channel, go to the website, check out what we're doing, and uh, you can reach me through that. And if you'd like to do a consultation with me, uh, I work with a, a company called Plant Based Telehealth, and for a very reasonable fee, uh, we can actually do uh, a uh, an interaction. Uh, on a clinical level. Uh, so check out plantbasedtelehealth.com. Thanks for letting me get that information across. Not a problem. We'll make sure we put it in the notes and share it out to people. And thank you so much for spending all this time with us and sharing your knowledge. We always love speaking with you and, and working with you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sean. What a great service you did for your viewers to get this information out. You're a, you're a healer in your own right. And it's an honor to work with you. All the best, and we love SoFlo Vegans. It's so good to be a SoFlo Vegan. I'm SoFlo, and I love being uh, a vegan. So all the best to everyone watching. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.